Good morning and welcome to St. George's Anglican Church in Guelph, Ontario. My name is Rafe Blackman and I serve as the rector here. And today helping me bring you this worship is Sophie Wilhelm and Alexander Muth, our singers. Alexander's also going to read the first reading. Our organist and choir director, Jerry Manning, uh, is here. And on videography is Laura Keller and Tony Atia is our sexton. We've uh, shifted a little bit um, in terms of our zones, but that hasn't changed much for live attendance at our worship. Um, our bishops are holding back on that, wanting to be more cautious, and, uh, um, and, uh, and, and so with that abundance of caution, we support that. We will be able to have more people involved in the presentation of these online live worship services, so that will start to happen more next week and in the weeks following. A uh, couple other announcements just before we move fully into our worship time. Here at St. George's we have an annual vestry meeting coming up and that's next Sunday at 1 o'clock. It will be a virtual meeting on Zoom. In order to be connected to that you need to send an email to Laura Keller in the office and she will send you the link. That's how we're uh, doing our pre-registration for that meeting and getting people linked into the Zoom. It'll be 1 o'clock next Sunday. We will still have both services, 8.30 and 11, live streamed in the morning before that. If you'd like to be part of our Lenten um, uh, devotional study, um, it's called Again and Again, a Lenten Refrain. It's uh, put together by uh, a consortium called A Sacred Art. Um, again, of clergy, of poets, of musicians, and, uh, and the reflections are, are quite wonderful. It will be thematically part of our services. Some of our liturgy um, is, is things that they suggested we use, and so you'll have pieces of that as we go through Lent. So that's our focus. Again, if you'd like to be part of that, send an email to Laura in the office. And now I wish to acknowledge that we meet on land that at the time of contact was held by the Attawadron as an area of trade and ceremony by the two rivers. At various times the land was occupied by both the Haudenosaunee from the south and the Anishinaabe from the north. In more recent times the Huron Treaty gave rights to the Mississaugas of new credit. May we who dwell on or visit this land also be good stewards and honor those who came before us. We continue in worship.
As it's Lent, we continue with our penitential order. God meets us in the night, before the sun rises, before the wound heals, before there are answers, before there is closure. God meets us in the light, where joy is effervescent, where laughter is contagious, where flowers bloom from cracks in the sidewalk, and where people gather around the table. God meets us at the threshold, at the edge of the water, at the beginning of the wilderness, at the start of something new, on the edge of faith. And if God meets us in all those places, then surely God meets us in between, staying with us through the wilderness. We are not alone. God is all around. Let us worship the God of the here and now. Again and again, God meets us where we are. God's love knows no bounds, which is hard for us to understand and easy for us to forget. Therefore, in confession, we remember together that we are not alone. And in a unified voice, we once again ask for God's grace in that holy reminder. Family of faith, please pray with me. God who meets us where we are, there is nowhere we can go that you are not. You were with Jesus at his baptism. You were with him in the wilderness and even in between. You were there saying aloud, this is my beloved. We know that you are with us too, in the good, the bad, and everything in between. But so often we act like we are alone. Instead of coming to you with our hurt, we hold it in or cast it onto others. Instead of coming to you with our joy, we credit ourselves and offer you nothing. How can we long for a deeper relationship with you while living like you are nowhere to be found? Forgive our self-centered ways. Remind us that in every breath, in every step, you are there. You are the God who meets us where we are before and behind, above and below, within and around. Amen. Family of faith, if you hear nothing else today, hear this. God is here. God sees you. God knows you. God meets you at the edge of every new beginning. And God calls you beloved. We are washed by the water. We are called beloved. Thanks be to God for a love like that. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with me. And let us pray the collect appointed for this day. God of the wilderness, your son battled with the powers of darkness and grew closer to you in the desert. Help us to use these 40 days to grow in wisdom and prayer so that we may witness to your saving love in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let us now listen for the word of God as we have our first reading.
said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you, and also with me. The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Dear friends, as always, I speak to you in the name of the one who is for us hope and salvation, Jesus the Christ. Amen. All four of the Gospels announce the beginning of Jesus' ministry with the story of his baptism, his coming to John at the Jordan, some way away from Nazareth, maybe towards Jerusalem, Maybe he's journeyed almost a hundred miles to get there. He comes to the edge of the water. He comes there and through the waters and then into the wilderness is prepared and set for the beginning and the fullness of the centrality of his ministry. Now the difference between the other Gospels and Mark is Mark does all of this in about six or seven verses. 
He has Jesus come from Nazareth to the edge of the water, baptized by John. The moment of Annunciation is really a conversation with Jesus. We don't know of others here. This is my beloved in whom I'm well pleased. He's then sent and caused by the Spirit to go into the wilderness. And then when John is arrested, he returns and takes up the mantle of his ministry. The others are slightly longer. Mark is that way, short, pithy, to the point. Uh, sometimes this gospel has been described as a, as, as a passion narrative with a prologue. And uh, that's one way to look at it. The ministry and direction and focus of Mark is to move all of this action towards Jerusalem and the events there. So at the start of this Lent, at this first Sunday in Lent, we have the story of Jesus' baptism. And I want to center into that, as I think it's an important way and place and time for us, particularly as we think about Lent as a time to reflect, renew, reshape our priorities and our relationships with God. I don't know about you, but I sometimes am taken aback a little bit by that phrase that's often used when someone um, uh, has, has an awakening of faith. Uh, they found God, is what people say as if God was ever lost. They found God. Even worse, I, I worry when I hear about people described as having found religion, uh, because religion is more often than not a construct that is built to try and hold our experience of God, or not, sometimes it's built entirely independently of that, but it's something uh, that people hold on to, which may or may not have much to do with God at all. Finding God when God is not lost is perhaps not the way to look at things. Rather, maybe it's to be known that we are found by God, that God who knows us from the womb, God who knows us from our beginning of our being, God who knows us in all that we are, finds us. And in that, if we take that sense and that understanding to the story of Jesus' baptism, we find in the incarnation the presence of God in Jesus a deep humility. Jesus does not come storming in on a great steed leading an army saying, let's rout some Romans. Jesus comes in humility to the edge where we are, the edge of our fragility and our brokenness. People have been coming to John for a baptism of repentance, renewal, transformation, metanoia, turning back into God, being washed, in a sense, dying to the selves they were and rising to new self. And Jesus comes there, the one who does not need baptism at all, submits to baptism by John. And as Jesus enters those waters, he takes all that we are, all of our brokenness, all of our frailty, all of the worries of creation into that water. And in that symbol and that metaphor of death and resurrection, it is recreated anew. And mirroring the beginning of Genesis with the creation narrative, the heavens are open and God says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. That's the refrain we have again and again in creation almost. God creates and in each stage of creation, God says, and it was good. And it is good. And so in this, Jesus comes to the water, in humility is baptized, is raised up of that in the metaphor of new life, and is announced as God's good creation. Then Jesus goes and is caused to go by the Spirit into the wilderness, tempted, famished, ministered to by angels, but setting again the sights and the goals that the perfection of serving God is in humility, in self-giving, in selflessness. And then when the time is right, he returns to take up his mantle of full ministry. I want to touch a little bit on Noah because sometimes we get things wrong in the way God has set covenants. We talk about God's covenant with God's people throughout the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, God coming and forming a people the people turning away, God redeeming, bringing them back, God sending messengers, and the utmost and fullness of that salvation history is manifest and made complete in Jesus. But we sometimes miss things because we make it all about us. We make it so anthropocentric that we forget that in the covenant in Noah, 
where God promises never to do a flood on the earth again and to put God's bow into the air, what we call the rainbow when we see it, as a reminder never to destroy. God's covenant is with humanity and all the creatures of earth. Humanity and all the creatures, all of the living things, all of the things that make up this earthly paradise. It's not just about us, it's about all of God's creation, all of what God has breathed into being. And we need to see that here too at the edge of the water where Jesus comes, that liminal space where we stand, in a sense, naked to who we really are. With all of our brokenness, all of our need for healing, we're all standing there with Jesus. And we move into the waters, and in the waters we both die and are rise, risen, are raised to new life. Powerful, but it's for all of creation as well. And that, for me, is a great place for us to start our Lenten pilgrimage. We are doing, as I said at the beginning, a devotional series uh, from Sanctified Art, which is art and poetry and reflections and some music and various other things reflecting on the theme again and again God comes to us. Again and again God meets us at the edge of that water, at that edge of space where we are broken. Again and again God says, I love you. Again and again God says, come to me, be renewed, be built again, be recreated. Again and again God restores us. And so in the cycles of our worship, in the yearly celebrations of Lent, we come again knowing our frailty, knowing our brokenness, knowing our need for God. Not to find God, but because we are already found by God and invited into that new life, that living space, that water of rejuvenation and hope. So come to the waters again and again. Come to new life again and again. Come to resurrection and metanoia again and again. Turn into God, for God will receive us, encourage us, forgive us, and restore us again and again. In Jesus' name, amen.
My friends, let us now turn to our prayers of the people. Holy God, satisfy us with your love in the morning, and we will live this day in joy and praise. Protect, O God, your people in every need. May love and sincerity reign in your church and its mission. Today we pray for the work of the church throughout the world. And we pray in particular for our Anglican church throughout the world. And in the Anglican cycle of prayer, we remember the church of the province of Central Africa, praying that God bless them in all the challenges that they face. And in our Anglican Church of Canada, we pray for all of our varied ministries. And those who lead us, Linda, our primate, Mark, our national indigenous archbishop, Anne, our metropolitan archbishop, and within our diocese of Niagara for Bishop Susan and the people of Christ Church Flamborough, their ministries and their mission. In our cycle of prayer at St. George's, where we are remembering intentionally uh, people in our parish role, a few each Sunday, we remember these people and their households and their families praying God's blessings upon them. Hank and Joanne Hunts, Desiree, Nadia, Anastasia, and Tamar. Karen Hunter, Tara Hyatt, Owen and Abby, Patricia Ng, David and Natalie Innes and Stephanie, Mac and Jane Irvine, Bill Irving, Peter and Sandra Irving, Grant and Brendan, Deanne Isley and James, and Greg Jusina. May God uphold them and bless them and their households. Holy God, give your wise spirit to all in power. Bless our cities and our countryside and cause those in power to have compassion and to serve the peoples that they are put in charge of. We pray for the many broken places in our world, the many places where there are uprisings, where there is economic disparity, where people are forced to be refugees, where there is food insecurity, where there is abuse, war, conflict, all the things that cause us fear. We also give thanks for those who are working hard to alleviate those injustices and to transform our world. We pray as well for the gifts of this earth. Show us how to share the fruits of the earth equitably and bless all those who work the earth for their living. As well, we remember those who are in prison, those who are institutionalized, those who are brokenhearted, we ask that you defend and care for the elderly and that you make an end of injustice in our society. We pray for those who are downtrodden, marginalized, those who are victims of abuse and addiction, those who are improperly housed and underfed in our community. We remember those in particular in the hospital at this time, Elowen, Ryan, Bruce, Mark, and any others that you may wish to name now before God. We pray for those for whom special prayers have been asked. For Ron, Trevor, Ned, Kate, Paul and Sarah, Michael, Kieran, Dieter, Gregson and Suzanne, Susan and family, Camilla and family, Inez, Dorothy, Margaret, Andy, Bill and Marilyn, Jim, Vivian, Dave, Anne, Dorothy, Eleanor, Mary, Michael and Jackie, and any others that you may wish to name now before God. O 
Holy God, bless all peoples and give us peace and harmony together. Show your mercy to all. We ask that you forgive our persecutors and slanderers, that you calm their hostility, and that you forgive our own injustices and cause us to correct them. Holy God, we remember all whom you have called to yourself, those who have all fallen asleep to rest into your eternal presence. And we give thanksgiving for the blessings of our lives, the gifts of abundance, the gifts of love, the gifts of support that cause us happiness and joy and encouragement in the fullness of living in this life. Holy God, our sole refuge and our only hope, Give us grace to consecrate ourselves tirelessly to your service. We ask this in Jesus' name, by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, my friends, we come to the time of sharing the peace. We share it at a distance, we share it separate, but we still share it knowing that we are in community and called to be peacemakers and bearers of peace wherever we live and the peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace. I invite you to join with me as we pray the prayer over the gifts. God, our refuge and our strength, receive all we offer you this day, and through the death and resurrection of your Son, transform us to his likeness. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with me. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of heaven and earth, because you bid your faithful people to cleanse their hearts and to prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that reborn through the waters of baptism and renewed in the Eucharistic mystery, we may be more fervent in prayer and more generous in the works of love. Therefore, we raise our voices to you in praise to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, Lord our God, for the goodness and love you have made known to us in creation, in calling Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night that he was handed over to suffering and death, a death he freely accepted, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, 
And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, do it for the remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, according to his command, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, and we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we, made acceptable in him, may be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, reconcile all things in Christ and make them new and bring us to that city of light where you dwell with all your sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, our Savior, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By whom, and with whom, and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, almighty God, now and forever. As our Savior taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. We break this bread, communion in Christ's body once broken. Let your church be the wheat which bears its fruit in dying. If we have died with him, we shall live with him. If we hold firm, we shall reign with him. My friends, we're still in that time of receiving communion spiritually because we're at a distance, but that spiritual reception of communion reminds us that we are brought together in communion in Christ, in his body and his blood, by the presence of Christ in our midst. There is a prayer for you to pray at this time that is displayed, and I invite you to use that. These are indeed the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. Faithful God, in this holy bread you increase our faith and hope and love. Lead us in the path of Christ, who is your word of life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Just before we do the sending forth and send you back into whatever this day has for you, I want to thank Sophie and Alexander and Jerry and Laura and Tony for all being with me here this morning and for all of you who are tuning in. Um, I don't know about you, but when I got up to walk the dog this morning, it's a nice bright sunny day here in Guelph for those of you who aren't here, but we're still having some of the lingering effects from that huge polar vortex that went all the way down to Texas, and we do continue to pray for all those souls there. But it was minus 20 when I took the dog out for a walk this morning, but we're on our way to a balmy minus three. So you can live in hope or you can do what I'm planning to do, give up winter for Lent. Um, again, our blessings to you. I did tell you the announcements at the beginning. I do hope that you will connect with us in the weeks to come and in our journey in Lent in our devotions. As we leave this space, may your mouth speak of God's goodness. May your arms hold those in need. May your feet walk toward justice. May your heart trust its worth. May your soul dance in God's grace, and may you be, and may this be your rhythm again and again and again until God's promised day. In the name of the lover, the beloved, and love itself, go with courage, go with heart, go in peace.